It's been two weeks since the MDR came into effect, and you've updated all your procedures for compliance with the MDR for CE marketing. This video is going to tell you what you probably forgot to update in your labeling procedure. First of all, there's not even a requirement for a labeling procedure in the MDR. In fact, there's not even a requirement for compliance with ISO 1345 or ISO 1345 certification. If you look in Article 10 of the MDR, that's where it requires that you have a procedure for different things, but not labeling. That's where it requires that you have a quality system, but not labeling. If you look in ISO 1345-2016, in Clause 7.5.1, that's where you'll find a requirement for defining your labeling operations, but it doesn't say you have to have a documented procedure. The place for that requirement is in 21 CFR 820.120. That's where the FDA says the organization shall establish a documented procedure for control of labels. So that's where your requirement is. But if the MDD didn't have the requirement and the MDR doesn't have the requirement, why do I need to update my labeling procedure? Well, in the MDD, we had a labeling section in Annex 1, Section 13, they had requirements for a label and requirements for instruction for use. It was under the category of information provided by the manufacturer. So the way we had that being met as a requirement in our labeling procedure is we had a checklist that went through all the requirements in Section 13, and you had to indicate how your label or how your instruction for use met that requirement. We also had the Canadian medical device regulations, the labeling requirements there, and the FDA requirements. So now that we have an MDR, we go to the same section, Annex 1, and we that's called the General Safety and Performance Requirements, or GSPR. And we go to the very end, Section 23 is where there's requirements for the information provided by the manufacturer. There are four subsections. One is general requirements, one is label, or two is label requirements, three is requirements for the primary sterile barrier label requirement, and the fourth one is for instruction for use. So we could just create another checklist that has all the requirements of the GSPR, but that would be a 22 page checklist. So we're going to do what we did for the MDD and just create a checklist that's just those requirements. And we have that available if you want to purchase our labeling procedure. But if you want to create your own, it's just a matter of creating a little checklist and copying and pasting the requirements from section 23. And if you want to make it even shorter, you could split it up. 23.1 is the general requirements. You can probably put those directly in the procedure. 23.2, you could have a one page labeling requirements. 23.3, you could have a primary ster sterile barrier label requirements checklist, one page. And then the last one, you could have probably about a four page checklist for what needs to be in your instruction for use. And every time you would create one of those types of documents, you would review that checklist requirements document where it can be found in your label or instruction for use and attach that to the approval of the label or instruction for use. So that's our recommendation on how to update your labeling procedure so it meets the requirements of the new MDR. You might ask, what other requirements do I need to have to comply with the MDR that might need to be in my labeling procedure? Well, if you look at GSPR 23.1, there's a requirement in there for any information provided by the manufacturer to the patients or users needs to also be provided on your website. And the easiest way to comply with that is to make your instruction for use downloadable from your website. A lot of companies don't like that. They don't want to make their instruction for use easy for anybody to download, including their competitors. But because everybody has to do that, that levels the playing field. So that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to take your instruction for use and make it available on your website. The next requirement is for translation. We actually combined our labeling and our translation requirements into one procedure. So we call it labeling and translation procedure. You don't have to do that, but that's what we did. And they really didn't change the requirement for, for translations. They just clarified what they meant. So everybody's doing it the same way. You have to have a labeling, uh, sorry, a translation procedure or a process. You have to have a mechanism for verifying the accuracy of that. Usually that's reconciliation of any differences from a forward and backward translation. You need to make sure the people translating are qualified and have a process for making sure of that. 
You also want to make sure that you um, have your um, your labeling accuracy checked by, let's say, your authorized representative or your distributors, or your importers. You're going to make these translations available to them and make sure you're providing them in the right languages for the member states you're going to. You need to make sure that you have um, the translations for each member state in one of the recognized languages for that member state. So if they recognize four different languages, you can you need to provide it in one of those languages or potentially all four. Um, some of the member states require it in multiple languages, some only require it in one of these. But you have to make sure that you cover the languages required by each member state if you're gonna ship it to that member state. And then you also, of course, are gonna have to make those available on your website for download. And Companies in the past were saying, well, I'll do it when somebody requests it. I'll provide English, but when they request a different language, I'll translate. I'll quickly translate it on Google Translate. That's not going to work. You need to actually do an accurate translation, have a process, and it needs to be done before you make your product available in those markets. And you actually have to show evidence of that to your notified body, and it can be requested by, let's say, your authorized representative or the competent authority as well. Now that you have translated versions and you have it on your website and you've verified you meet all the Annex 1 GSPR requirements, what else do you need? There's an implant card requirement and a UDI requirement. They're not exactly labeling, but they're usually associated with labeling. So how do we make sure we comply with those? I think the easiest way is probably to have a separate procedure for implant cards because implant cards are a very specific requirement that don't apply to all devices, just implants as defined by the MDR. So we created a separate implant card procedure and we would reference that in the labeling procedure. You also need a UDI procedure, but there's an FDA UDI procedure, an MDR UDI procedure. So we've created a UDI procedure that's separate and we reference that in the labeling procedure. Another thing that comes up is in one of the articles for economic operators, specifically the importer, there's a requirement for the importer to apply a label that includes their contact information as well. It could be applied by the importer. It could be applied by your company for the importer. That doesn't matter. But a lot of people have been arguing, well, it doesn't specifically say you have to apply a label on the label for the importer. Couldn't you just provide it on like the declaration of conformity instead? And I was skeptical of that approach to it because I thought the member states really sounded like they wanted this to have the importer on the label. And sure enough, when they released in April of this year, the information required by the manufacturer in its newest standard, EN ISO 20417-2021, yep, there is a section in there specifically for the importer, and it says the importer shall apply a label to your label that indicates their contact information. And it even references a symbol for the importer 5.1.8. I said, wait a second, I'm, I can't find 5.1.8 in the label, in, sorry, in the symbols standard. So I went to the new ISO DIS, which is the draft standard for 15223-1. It was released in 2020. And sure enough, in the draft, they have 5.1.8 and it's a symbol for importers. I think they also have a symbol for distributors. So you should really get a hold of that draft standard and hopefully soon they're gonna be releasing the 2021 final version of that symbol standard. But we will have to include in our labels that importer symbol and the importer's information. Now there is a note that says only um, that this could will only be required if um, the, the uh, place where you're distributing the product, that jurisdiction requires it. However, that means any one of the member states could require this and unless you plan on creating a separate label for each member state, you might as well create one uh, that's the same across the board and include that information on all of them. But it does also say that it doesn't need to be provided by the company. It could be applied by the importer or a third party. So you can have somebody else label the product when it gets to Europe. That, recovers, that covers our importer requirements. And I told you about two updated standards. If you look below in the video, if you're watching the video on our YouTube channel, or if you look, if you're reading this in our blog and watching this video on our blog, down below I have hyperlinks for where you can find the requirements for implant cards, UDI, our procedures, uh, the GSPR, 
and for these standards, the uh, EN ISO 20417 2021 in the draft version of the new labeling, uh, sorry, in, uh, symbol standard. So what else can you find here? Well, if you read below on our blog, we've actually provided a link for purchasing our labeling procedure. And for the month all the way up till I think July 7th, we're offering a 50% discount. So for those of you that still need to update your labeling procedure or don't have a labeling procedure, this is a quick way to get in compliance. And I hope that helps you. If you have any further questions, don't hesitate, hesitate to click on the Calendly link. We provide that in our um, blog. So if you click through to the blog, you can find that link and schedule a meeting with us to ask additional questions or for help with review of your labels. Thank you and hope you uh, like this video. Don't forget to like below and uh, comment please and let us know what we should include next week for a video. Bye-bye.